We are delighted to be joined by author Megan Hill, whom is here to talk about her brand new book, A Place to Belong, Learning to Love the Local Church. Hello and welcome to Exposit the Word, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. Before you tell us why you wanted to write this book, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a Christian. I um, actually have the most boring testimony on the planet, <laughs> and um, I was raised in a Christian home yeah. um, by Bible-believing parents, and I honestly don't remember the moment that I came to faith in the Lord, and for a long time, honestly, I struggled with that, yeah. thinking I would hear other people's testimonies, and I would think, oh, that's so much more exciting, you know, their life of drugs and sex and rock and roll, and Jesus changed all of that, and now everything's different, and my life didn't really, I couldn't point to a moment when I felt like everything was different yeah. or was that exciting. And it really honestly took me a long time to come to grips with the fact that it's really the grace of God that's amazing in our testimonies. And that's just as amazing as it was for me as a child growing up in a Christian home as it was for anyone, uh, wherever it is that the Lord saves them. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. You're missing a golden opportunity because uh, a friend of mine told me recently that an old lady stood up in her church and she gave her testimony and said that she was saved from a life of, you know, crime and all, she listed all of these terrible, horrendous things where everyone's jaw just dropped and she said that, you know, she was saved from it because she was saved when she was six years old. <laughs> so... <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. So what does life look like for you now, Megan? Um, so I live in Western Massachusetts in the United States, yeah. and um, my husband is a pastor of a small, we have about 100 member uh, Presbyterian church here in Massachusetts. We have four children. I work as an editor for the Gospel Coalition, yeah. and then I also have my own writing projects. Yeah, great. So what does church look like for you guys? So um, we have probably about 100 to 110 people that come on the Lord's Day. We have a morning service and an evening service that are separate from each other. Um, there's a different, you know, different preaching, yes. um, different service each time. Um, and it's pretty simple, really. Um, singing and corporate prayer is a big emphasis and the reading and preaching of the word and then just God's people all together, which of course, in this crazy pandemic season, we all miss so much. Yeah, that's good. You've written a book on corporate prayer before, haven't you? I have. Yeah, that was my first book. Ah, excellent. You must feel a lot of responsibility whenever you're involved with corporate prayer now, Megan. I do. They're always like, oh, ask ask Megan to pray. She's the prayer meeting girl. <laughs> yeah. So what made you want to write this book? Um, honestly, I was just reading so many stories of people who had been disillusioned mm. by the church and who had... Um, left the church often, um, mm. sometimes returning, sometimes leaving, never to return, um, sometimes because of serious hurt um, in, that happened to them in the church, and sometimes just feeling like, what's really the point? This is awkward. This is uncomfortable. This is unremarkable. Mm. I have something better I could be doing with my Sunday and really with the rest of my week. And um, I really, I kept reading these testimonies, kept coming up over and over again and the things that I was exploring and even in friendships that I had with people. And uh, it, it was really compelling to me because I, on the one level, I really resonated with that sense of, you know what, I, uh, on the surface, at least, church is not always that great. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of, it's the same people. They show up every week and they do the same thing and yeah. we don't see a lot of results. And yeah, I kind of get that. But at the same time, I really believe that there's great value to the church, that the scriptures testify to the great value of the church. And so I kind of wrote this book almost as sort of a love letter to the church, exploring what is the value of the church? What does the Bible say about that? And how can, if I believe what God says about the church, how can that change then sort of my ordinary week by week experience in the church? Yeah, that's really good. Okay, well, that's a great place to start. What does the Bible say about the local church then, Megan? Oh, the Bible says all kinds of great <laughs> things about the local church. Yeah. Um, in this book, you know, I, t I take sort of the terms that the New Testament uses, um, mm. although certainly... The Old Testament is not silent on what it means to be the people of God gathered in worship. But um, the New Testament uses all these great terms like saints, you know, the yeah. holy ones. It calls the people of God's church holy. Yeah. Um, it calls us brothers and sisters. You know, it says that we're a family together. We're God's family. It talks about us being the body, that, that we're the body of Christ and that he's our head and that we have these gifts and these callings that we then exercise kind of as part of this body that's interdependent and working together. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I could go on and on, but there are just 
so many really beautiful terms that the Bible uses that saying this is true about this church. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to love the local church and what does that love actually look like? Yeah, I think it's important to love the local church because God loves the local church. Yeah. You know, we have been redeemed um, by the Lord and we have been called uh, to be his and he set his name upon us. And then we want to love what he loves. Mm. And again and again and again in the scriptures, he calls the church his beloved and his beloved people. And so I think it's in imitation of him. Um, it's, it's godliness, really, to love the things that God loves. And so that's important for us to cultivate in our hearts. I think it looks like um, showing up, yeah. um, committing, committing to the church. Uh, 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 membership, I know, looks a little different in different places, but, but you know, making sure that you're publicly committed to that local body. Um, it, it means praying for those people. I think that's a really great way to stir up love in your heart. You know, it's hard to not like somebody if you're praying for them, if yeah. you're really invested in them so enough true. to so bring true. them before the throne of grace. Yeah. Um, worshiping alongside them wholeheartedly, encouraging them, you know, all those one another commands that we see in the New Testament come to play as we live out this love that we have for these people. Mm. You mentioned it's something that you cultivate and obviously develop. How, how can... Um, brothers and sisters within the church sort of encourage each other to and spur each other on to love the church more? I think that um, just, you know, even something simple as smiling at one another, you mm. know, um, before this pandemic, we used to, you know, give handshakes and hugs. I don't yeah. know when we'll get back to that <laughs> again. But, but you know, I'm glad to see you here. Um, learning people's names, you know, the uh, the Apostle John, at the end of one of his letters, he says, greet the brothers each by name. And mm. just knowing people's names is a great way to foster love in our local congregation. It's a way that says, I see you, I know you, you're valuable to me, you belong here, we're together in this. Um, some of those just super simple acknowledgments of one another, I think, are ways that we can encourage one another to feel connected and to love one another. Yeah, sure. That that also works in the opposite way, doesn't it? I, I've got a friend who's been going to a, a really big church for about three years. There's about 800 people that go to this church. I know you mentioned that your church is about 100. And the pastor came up to them after about two and a half years and said, oh, great, it's, it's you know wonderful to meet you guys. This is your first time here. <laughs> Ouch! Oh no! What What are your thoughts on, and, and what does the Bible say about the size of churches, Megan? For for all your research, what what are your findings? I don't, I don't think we really have a you know. There's no like cap on the size of churches no. um, that we can see mandated in Scripture, but we certainly do just sort of practically see that it does make it hard to greet the brothers each by name, as yeah. I said. You yeah. know, if you don't actually know the people and you know if there's too many people to greet them by name makes it challenging for elders you know mm. to shepherd um and pastors and elders to shepherd the people if there's too many of them you know i mean and churches i was part of a really wonderful church for many years that had two thousand members wow. and they they did a really wonderful job of dividing up the congregation and assigning elders to them and so it can be done yeah. but it does get more difficult you're right yeah yeah there's so much work to be done for us christians how important is it for somebody to be using their gifts within the church and to find a way of serving in some way yeah, I mean, I think absolutely it's necessary. And I think First Corinthians makes that clear, right? The mm. eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. You know, yeah. each part is valuable. And um, that passage even says, God sets the members in the body, each one as he chooses. And yeah. so you've been placed in your local church by God's choosing, and he does have work for you to do there. I love how, you know, in the body, we have, we each have different gifts and your gifts are probably different than my gifts and then the people next to us. And, you know, and we use those gifts and then we actually get to experience something of Christ himself because, yeah. you know, we have some of the gifts, but Christ has all of the gifts. Yeah. And so when we come into the church and we see all of the gifts being expressed, we experience something of Christ in the way that we couldn't if we were just isolated on our own with our own sort of measly set of gifts, to be honest. If you've been around church long enough, you're going to have some scars and probably some baggage What's the best way to come alongside someone that's been hurt by the church? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the things that's important is just acknowledging that all of us have probably had bad experiences in the church. You know, I don't think you meet anyone who doesn't feel like at some point they've been ignored or Mm -hmm. misunderstood or um, overlooked or mistreated or, you know, so we can really can sympathize with one another in this because we know how that feels to want to belong and yet to have been sinned against. One of the places that I often go is even to the example of the Apostle Paul. Mm. Um, You know, this, um, you know, the great Apostle Paul, the writer of the majority of the New Testament. um, And yet, when you look at his story, he was hurt by the church. Um, You know, in the end of 2 Timothy, he talks about how he had his defense before um, the Roman government. And he Mm. says, no one came to my defense. So no one came with him. No one supported him. And um, we see other examples like that, you know, he was all alone. They've all deserted him, he says, you know, and so even the apostle Paul had these experiences of being hurt um, by the church. And yet so many of the terms for the church that we have come to us from the apostle Paul. I mean, he called the Corinthian church, the saints Mm -hmm. over and over again, the holy ones, you know, I mean, those Corinthians were a mess, right? I mean, they had so much trouble going on in that church. And yet Paul believed the best of them. He believed what God said was true about them. And he loved them, even though they were a mess, because God had set them apart as holy. You know, he calls them brothers and sisters. He calls them beloved because he's believing what the Bible says is true. So I think the more that we look into what the scripture says is true about the church, the more we can cling to that even when we recognize there are hurtful things that do happen in the church and they happen to us and it's not fun. It is quite hurtful. Mm. What are the characteristics of a healthy church? I think the Bible is absolutely central um, to a healthy church. And when you have people who are coming together, who have been changed by the grace of Christ, who are committed to Uh, believing and acting out what the Bible says is true, Mm. then you have a church that's going in the right direction. You know, when the Bible is central, when we're all submitting to what the scripture says, where we may come to different conclusions, we may have arguments about it at times, we may, you know, but fundamentally when what we all want is to be conformed to the word of God, then that's a good place for a church to be. Yeah, that's so good. So, Obviously, we know these things as secondary things, and um, Gavin Auckland has just written a brilliant book about what are the hills to die on with with Crossway, um, the same publisher as you, Megan. What what would you say are the non negotiables when seeking a sound church? Um, I would say that you know Christ. What it what is taught about Christ Himself is absolutely non negotiable. Yeah. So uh, Christ's uh, work on our behalf and his atoning death and his resurrection. I mean, that those are the sort of things that are fundamental to our faith. And so you don't want to be in a church that doesn't hold to those things. Yeah. Um, then you need to have some kind of biblical leadership. Um, uh, I'm a Presbyterian, so I'd hold to Presbyterian form of government, but I don't yeah. consider that to be, you know, the, the hill to die on, as you yeah. said. But yeah. you do need some biblically informed structure of leadership. Um, yeah. And Baptist congregationalists have good reasons and Anglicans have good reasons for theirs. And, and that's good, you know. Um, so you need some kind of, of shepherds for the flock. Um, and, you know, and then you need to be clear, as I said, that the Bible is the thing that's central to your existence, is central to your worship, and it's central to the life that you live together to mm. be informed by the scripture. Mm. We live in a consumer age, very much based on feelings. Bearing that in mind, there are lots of different flavours of what church looks like for lots of different people. How do we avoid crashing into that culture where we end up having a a sort of a list of criteria that we need to have and somehow, you know, and you see people almost church shopping? Yeah, and that is, you know, we have to be careful there, right, because you're everybody's going to have some sort of extra biblical criteria. I'm not going to drive three hours to go to church. That's just not practical for me. Or, you know, um, if it's a congregation where they don't speak the same language that I speak, well, that's just not going to be good. You know, so we have, we do have some sort of, criteria that we have to place on the church that we would attend. Um, And we just sort of hold those more or less loosely, I think, depending on how they, how closely they align with scripture and with our biblical prerogatives. But I do think it does come back to, is this a church where 
Christ and the word of God are taken seriously. And that's the place that I want to be, even if it doesn't always feel super comfortable, even if it's not always sort of my preference, as it were, um, it, we worship together in honor of the Lord. And so we want to do what's pleasing to him rather than necessarily what's pleasing to me. What's the best way to lead a family in growing in their love for the local church? Um, yeah, so I have four children. I myself grew up in church, so I probably have more experience um, uh, from my own experiences as a child as uh teaching my own children who are still somewhat young. My oldest is just a teenager now. But um, I do think one thing um, that's important is just to speak well of the church um, to in in the interactions that we have with one another, with our spouses, with our children, of using these biblical terms. You know, these are the ones that are the holy ones. These are our brothers and sisters. Yeah. These are Christ's beloved. Yeah. And so we speak well of the congregation in a way that encourages people to think well of the congregation. And then I think another thing is just the priority that we place on it as a family, that it's, it, you know, being a part of the church is not negotiable, you know, in the same way that going to school is not something that we allow kids to decide, do they want to go to school or not? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we say, no, this is what's good for you. Well, being part of the church is what's good for your soul. And so it's not really negotiable. Yeah, so good. How would you caution a church which is becoming seeker sensitive and trying to attract new members? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's good to want people who are apart from Christ to come to know Christ. Yeah. So I think I would start very gently, mm. um, that this, this is a, this is a good desire that, um, the ends of the earth would come to know Christ and to worship and embrace him. That, that, that's a really good thing, mm. but we do need to make sure that we're not compromising on things that the scripture says, mm. uh, in order to. Um, make ourselves more palatable to people. I mean, the Bible does say uh, Jesus himself said very strong things about being the way, the truth, and the life. And Christ himself is the only way. And the one that comes to him has to lay down their life and take up their cross. And, you know, that these there are claims that Christ makes on our lives and claims that he makes of himself that we can't compromise in the hope that someone might find us more palatable. Yeah, so good. I guess there's something there, isn't there, that, and we've seen it time and time again, if a church begins to soften teaching to attract people in, then the only way you're going to keep those people coming back is is to continue to soften the teaching and, and you end up in a situation where doctrine becomes really diluted and, 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 and compromised in many ways, right? Yeah, it's, it ends up being sort of a bait and switch otherwise mm. right then oh we brought you in on this but now yeah. guess what this is what jesus really that's says right. yeah. Yeah. or you have to continue with it and then that's not really bringing them to the, the whole christ yeah absolutely what would you do if you bumped into a friend and they told you that they had joined a church which you knew was unbiblical how would you handle that conversation um i would say oh what 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 brought you to that church how did you decide to go to that church and um, what what processes led to that decision and then i would respond um sort of beyond you know at least in my context where i live yeah. uh, sort of gospel preaching churches are very few and far between yeah. um the barna group just did a survey this year that my sort of metropolitan area is the most secular place in america and yeah. um, so gospel preaching churches are very few and far between and most often the answer i get is it was just too far we moved to this place and there just were no good churches and so we're just going to what's near us you know and so then i think you know having heard their answer what went into that decision then i would sort of push back on some of those sort of things you know well this is really important so maybe it's worth driving a little bit further or maybe it's even worth moving yeah. you know to be closer to another church you know so just kind of exploring what their reasons are because that's really where the heart of the issue is going to be and trying to go from there yeah um, we would have both met people um, who say that they are christian but they don't belong to a local church what are your thoughts about that megan yeah you know it, 
in scripture in the whole of scripture mm. there are really no lone believers you mm. know from from adam on as soon as adam was created god said oh it's not good for him to be alone yeah. we need yeah. to have a congregation here yeah. we need to have eve and you know that's sort of a proto church there adam yeah. and eve in the garden and of course you know through old testament israel god's people were constantly, you know, name, we have all those lists of names, all those genealogies that people like to skip over because they're so hard to pronounce. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> but, but that teaches us something, right? Each of those people was called by name and belonged to this bigger body and there's not any stragglers. Um, and so I think that we see that really it's, it's not an option in scripture to mm. be sort of a lone Christian communing with God out in the woods rather than joining yourself with a body um, of believers. That's really the idea in the book of Acts. You know, we see these mass conversions of people and what, what does it say about them? Well, so many thousand were added to the church. You know, it's just assumed they come to faith, they're baptized, they're part of the church. Mm. Um, That's really the only option. Yeah. Yeah. We're recording this um, during the season where many people have been, uh, you know, in lockdown for seven to eight weeks, which has meant that they've been doing church in a very different way at home, often in their pajamas with a cup of coffee. What would you say to those people that have become very comfortable with that new um, flavour of church and and to the point where they're actually questioning whether they're going to go back and, and, and do church like they was doing, you know, part of a church like they was before? I know I'm questioning whether we have to wear shoes to church. Yeah. That's the real thing. I don't <laughs> mind getting dressed up. I don't mind, you know, but the shoes, man, that's going to kill me. Um, yeah, I think that um, I think that that's where it becomes important to really see the fact that we are better together, as it were. Mm-hmm. That's been a big, at least in the States, that's like a big phrase during the pandemic, right? We're all in this together, yeah, even yeah. though we're separated in yeah. our own houses. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but but really, the picture of the body is that it is better together mm-hmm. and that there is you do miss when you're just on your couch in front of your screen you know you you miss something of being together and mm-hmm. i think some of those things that we miss are just the opportunities to encourage and exhort one another that just mm-hmm. happen so much more naturally when we're in the same place together mm-hmm. we miss the prayers being joined together you know as we pray to the lord and hearing the amens of the people around us and knowing that our hearts are joined together in this same Mm -hmm. prayer. You know, we miss the opportunity to hear the preaching together and then afterwards to say to one another, wow, this is how I'm going to apply it in my life and to be encouraged by that. We miss getting to see one another sort of living out truth Mm -hmm. in their lives Mm -hmm. and then being able to go, oh yeah, that's what that means for this context, this time period, this place where we live. Yeah, that that's a model of godliness for me that I need to imitate. Mm -hmm. And when we're separated, you know, we do the best we can and we did what we could for this season, but we do miss so many of those rich blessings of having other people to strengthen us in the faith. When you're a part of a local church, you become a family and you mentioned it earlier on, you know, you become brothers and sisters, but sometimes people have to move on for various reasons. How can someone leave a church well? I think that's a great question. Um, so I think first to leave well, you have to leave for good reasons. Um, and so you're leaving because you have to move or, um, for a job or, you, you know, you're physically moving. Uh, sometimes you have to leave because your convictions have changed and your conscience is now bound to some uh, theological position that the church that you're in doesn't hold and you have to honor your conscience and move on. Um, Sometimes you have to leave because your church um, has changed in some way and is no longer biblical. And I think all of those are legitimate reasons to leave. But I do think um, you're right that there's a right way and a wrong way to leave. And I think that um, a good way to start is to speak to your pastors or church leaders or elders Mm -hmm. about your concerns or your own changes and receive what they have to say. And then if it becomes clear that, no, we just, we have this theological difference, we're going to have to part ways, or if it's inevitable that physically you have to move or whatever, then you follow the process Mm -hmm. that they have for you. And each church is a little different, but you might have a letter of 
um, resigning your membership or whatever the process is that you follow. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important as you leave to continue to give thanks for that church and the place that it played in your spiritual maturity, even if there are things that you now disagree with, just to be grateful to the Lord for giving them and to speak well of it to others, even as you're on your way out the door, as it were. And then, of course, the other part of that is then to join yourself to another church, Mm -hmm. you know, not to leave and then just go wandering, but, but to leave because you must, and then find another biblical body to join yourself to where you can use your gifts and benefit from the body. What will church look like in eternity? Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be the best thing ever. (laughs) And I think that, you know, I, I hope that, as you said, we're recording this in the middle of this strange pandemic season, yeah. and I hope that our appetites have been sharpened, not just for the day when we can get together without masks, but yeah. the day when we can be with the, the great multitude that no one can number and, you know, we'll be sinless. And so there will be no hurts and the, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is sort of the book of Revelation's picture for the church in eternity, will be revealed as a, as a bride dressed up for her husband and you know so in all its glory and so the the thing that now looks so insignificant and small and fragile and unremarkable will be revealed uh to be the glorious bride of christ in eternity it's gonna be great yeah so good you've written a couple of other books and you mentioned um the corporate prayer one earlier on tell us about those books and what's been your favorite chapter that you've written so far out of all of your books megan wow so my first book was called Praying Together, yeah. and it's a book about corporate prayer. And um, my favorite chapter in that book, I write about how when we pray for one another, we grow in love for one another. Yeah. I think I mentioned that earlier, even alluded to that earlier, but how bearing one another's burdens and even entering into circumstances in other people's lives that are different from our own encourages us to love one another as we come together in um, prayer together. Um, And then my second book is called Contentment, and it's a 31-day devotional on contentment. So the idea is if you're struggling with contentment and you can spend a month just sort of seeing what the Bible has to say about contentment, even as you're sort of working through that in your own life. And that was super convicting for me. You should never, never, never um, offer to write a devotional on contentment because the Lord will teach you some things. But um, (laughs) but, but that was great to me too. Uh, My favorite part of that book is, was just meditating on Christ and how Christ was the perfectly content God man and what we can learn from him and also how he works contentment in us. What's been your favorite book that you've ever read, Megan? What's, and what resources have helped you grow most as a Christian? One of my favorite books, I don't, I don't know if I can commit to my favorite yeah. book, but one of my favorite books um, is Michael Reeves' Delighting in the Trinity. Uh, yeah, um, that was hugely sort of paradigm shifting for me. Mm. I think I never really thought that much about the Trinity before. And, you know, it was kind of like a mind bender puzzle in my brain. And so I didn't really spend much time on it, but reading that book, um, just in so many ways, uh, shaped my understanding of who God is. And so that's definitely one that I continue to return to. And what about podcasts? What the other half of the question? Sorry. Yeah, so, and, and other resources. So do you listen to any podcasts or is there any preachers that you listen to um, other than your husband? <laughs> yeah, and my dad. I listen to my dad too. Yeah, yeah so... Um, I am in a season of my life. I ha- actually have a toddler and a teenager and two kids in between. So podcasts are, don't really work very well for me because yeah. I have to listen and I keep getting interrupted. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I do try to do some reading um, and just um, various things. Right now I'm reading um, Jonathan Lehman's new book called One Assembly, yeah. which is sort of an argument for the local church not being multi-site um and it's fascinating i don't agree with everything that he says but it's super fascinating so i I love to read and um i read the resources that we post on the gospel coalition i edit for them so i i do think they have some faithful resources that we publish there and um, when people recommend books i take it seriously and add it to my ever-growing stack by my bedside table yeah awesome are you working on any other projects at the moment megan I am currently writing a book of meditations for pastors and elders' wives. It's going to be 50 meditations dealing with some of the sort of joys of ministry life and then also some of the challenges and sort of a book that um, 
wives of men who are in church leadership can you know, sort of pick up on the challenging days and uh, read that to find a bit of encouragement um, for for the life of ministry. Yeah, so good. What's the best way for anybody who's listening to get in touch with you? I know you're on social media. What are your, what are your handles, Megan? Um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. I don't have a good enough um, phone to be on Instagram. I can't take beautiful pictures. So um, <laughs> that is my problem there. I don't even remember what my handles are. I'm sorry. Oh, that's um, fine. But I think Megan Hill, I think you can find me. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll put the links in. I'll find them for you, Megan. And I'll put them in the links in the description below. <laughs> you can it. tell me what my handles are. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Megan. I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. Thanks so much for having me. That was great.